Well, hello. I want to welcome you to our Tuesday Bible study during the season of Lent, and I hope you are having a very fruit-filled Lenten season. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this opportunity to gather in the season of Lent. We hope it has been a blessing. We pray that you continue to guide us as we read from this passage this day and are inspired by what you want us to learn. For he asks us in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are looking at the book of Hebrews, and one of the things you've noticed about the epistle lessons, these epistle lessons that we're reading are appointed to go with the Sunday lessons. So this is a part of our lectionary lesson. This is what we read on Sunday in church. And the problem is, it's a great passage, but it's dropped out of nowhere. We don't understand where it came from, what the context is, what were the people thinking when they put this in our lectionary to be read, and what did the author of the book of Hebrews actually have to say? Because sometimes, you know, what the author of the book is trying to tell us is not the exact same thing that the people who compile the lectionary want us to know. So these sometimes are at war with each other. So let's take a look at this passage as a passage out of the scripture, and what is it trying to tell us? So here it is. So too, Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but it was he who said to him, he being God, you are my son, today I have fathered you. Just as he says in another passage, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his humanity, Jesus' humanity, he offered up both prayers and pleas with loud cries and tears to the one able to save him from death. He was heard because he was devout in his behavior. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from things that he suffered, and having been perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him, being designated by God as a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. Here is the lesson. Wow, what a passage. It is really rich. It is filled with some amazing things about the character and nature of Jesus. But before we get there, I want to ask a couple of questions. First of all, who wrote this book? Secondly, why? This all has to do with context because it gives us clues as to what the author of Hebrews was trying to tell us. Okay? So, the first thing I can tell you about who is it was most certainly not Paul. Now, I know you probably grew up with this idea that Paul wrote these books. This is a very ancient tradition, but it has nothing to do with the book of Hebrews. Nobody really knows. People just said, we don't know who it's from. Well, we'll, we'll say Paul wrote it because he wrote so much of the scripture. The problem is, there is a guy by the name of Origen, I know, funny name, huh? Origen, but he was an early church father, and, oops, there's an E in there, we'll get that right, Origen, distinguishing it from Origins, uh, Origen was an early church father who looked at this book and he said, you know what, this was not written by Paul, are you kidding me? It doesn't have the nature. In fact, he says it doesn't have the rudeness of expression of Paul. Okay? So here's the thing you have to understand. If you know anything about Greek, or you can read Greek, uh, one of the things when you read Paul's books, which we know are Paul's books, 1 Corinthians or Romans or whatever, his Greek is absolutely atrocious. He's a horrible Greek writer. He misspells a lot of words. It's one of the things, if you understand Greek, you read and say, well, I don't know that word. Oh, it's a misspelling. That's the problem, kind of like what I did down here. You misspelled the word. And so that's why you're, you're sometimes scratching your head and saying, what is Paul trying to tell us? I've never seen this word before. The sentence structure is atrocious. He would get an F in Greek composition because he is such a bad writer. And all of a sudden, we have this beautiful gem of a book that's polished, immaculate Greek. Uh, it is just a perfect book. It is a beautiful book. Now, Paul probably had some beautiful thoughts. He just couldn't express it in Greek because, again, his primary language was Hebrew. Well, actually, Aramaic. 
And then, of course, he also knew Hebrew. So uh, Greek was his tertiary language at best. <clears throat> so Paul did as best he could <clears throat> with as poor Greek uh, workmanship as, or Greek uh, uh, authorship as he had and his ability to understand and write Greek. But this author very clearly knew Greek, was a Greek speaker, and was an excellent writer. So this distinguishes this book. Making, uh, we certainly know it wasn't written by Paul. Who was it written by? I don't know. In fact, there are so many suggestions about who wrote uh, the book of Hebrews that it's kind of ridiculous to even try to come to some type of conclusion. I do like, there's a, a scholar by the name of Harnack who suggests this name. Priscilla. That this would be the only book in the Bible written by a female. There's some plausibility to this, and there might be a reason why we don't know the name of the person who wrote it, because maybe they were afraid if you put a woman's name on it, it wouldn't be read. Who knows? I mean, there's some, uh, it's possible. We don't really know who wrote it. It's all speculation. Harnack, by the way, argues very hard for her authorship of this to try to distinguish her, and I've read his argument. It's not any more compelling than any other argument, but I do find it really intriguing. So, who wrote it? We don't know. But we do know is a little bit maybe about why. We, we have an inkling that it was probably written to Roman Christians who had converted from Judaism. Okay? Roman Christians who had converted from Judaism. And they were wrestling with their faith because it seems like there was a little bit of persecution. Now, be cautious about this. It was not like the persecution of Nero. I don't think Christians were being rounded up and killed. This was a sporadic persecution. I mean, this week, we just heard in the United States uh, the unfortunate news that there is some, um, an evil person who walked into uh, some nail parlors and killed Asian people because of Asian hatred that's going around in some groups of people in our country, these types of racists and bigots. Um, it's not an organized persecution that's going on in our country against Asians, but it's happening, and Asians are, people of Asian heritage are feeling like they're under attack and are being threatened. So this is how the Christians were feeling in Rome. There was harassment taking place, and for some folks that were Jews, and had converted to Christianity, they were saying, maybe just walk away from this Christianity thing. Because I don't need this in my life. And so we have the sense that this is the reason why Hebrews was written. It was written to Jewish converts to Christianity who were wrestling with their faith and whether or not this Jesus thing was worth it after all. So that's the context. Now, with that in mind, we get this passage that Paul wrote, and it explains the relationship of Jesus. So, okay, it explains Jesus in relationship to the priestly order. But there's something really interesting that takes place that you probably didn't notice. What does he call Jesus? when he's making this connection between the priestly order of Aaron, dating all the way back to the time of Moses. All right? Listen to verse 5. So too Christ did not glorify him. Okay? Did you hear what he did? He didn't say Jesus. He said Christ, which is the Greek translation, Christos, of the Hebrew word, for Messiah. Okay? So this is kind of interesting. So he's calling Jesus by the title. Now when you think of the word Messiah, or when most Jews thought of the word Messiah, they thought of ruler. They thought of a king. They thought of somebody mighty. Okay? They thought of somebody who was glorified and magnified, and somebody who was up there at the pinnacle of things. So this is very intentional that he uses the word Christ, and then he relates 
this ruler, this king, this mighty person with priestly duties. Why does he do this? Well, let me tell you why. Jesus, as he said, is in direct lineage to Aaron, indicating that Jesus has come to perform some type of priestly duty. Now, what's a priest do? A priest is one who stands in the gap. All right? This is the person between God and humanity. But here's the truth. Every other priest was just a, fail, uh, a frail imitation. This is the priest, the only priest, the one who truly stands in the gap between us and God. Okay? So this is what he's trying to argue. So he indicates that he's a priestly duty to stand in the gap on our behalf. Now, as I said, the author calls him the Messiah, but the author is impressed, whoever this author may be, Priscilla, whoever, is impressed that this type of character, who should have power and might and be a ruler, would be submissive and of service as a priest. It's like these two totally contradictory things. Imagine that. So Jesus, the Messiah, is God-appointed to stand in the gap on behalf of humanity between us and God, even though he had the right to be elevated as a king. That's what, in just that one verse, verse 5, that the author is trying to tell us. So Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest. God appointed him. Because it was God who said to him, you are my son. Today I fathered you. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. This mighty ruler king should be clothed in majesty, has come to serve. <laughs> this is profound. But then he mentions that name, Melchizedek. What? <laughs> this is like crazy. Who in the world is Melchizedek? Okay, we have one reference to him in the Bible. I'm going to put this down just so you can take a look at it. It's Genesis 14, 18 to 20. Okay? That be it. Three verses, peoples. 18, 19, and 20. That's all we ever see of Melchizedek until, again, from the book of Hebrews, this name is name-dropped again. But listen to what we know about it, and then maybe you can understand why um, the author makes reference to Melchizedek. Uh, let me find it. Genesis 14, 18, 18, here it is. So, Abraham, Father Abraham, remember him? He fought a big, huge battle, was victorious, won, took home a bunch of spoils from this battle, and he's wandering in the wilderness, and so... He returned from his defeat of these people and the great kings and the king of Sodom and, uh, and uh, went out to meet him. Oh, and here's where we meet Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. There might be a thought there that this bread and wine is a connection between Christ because remember, early Christians associated that bread and wine, the breaking of bread and wine with Jesus. Okay? So there might be that in the background. It's not explicit, but it's probably in the background of the author's thinking. But that's not all. So Melchizedek brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. Oh, this guy is not even a Jew, okay? He's not Jewish, but he is the priest of God most high and a king. Do you hear that? He's both a king and the high priest. This is what fires the imagination of the author of Hebrews. 
This has never been done before, that connection between high priest and king and somebody who could do that with humility, who could be a king but also be submissive. So what happened? So Melchizedek blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, maker of heaven and earth. Be God be Blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And so Abram gave him a tenth of everything that he had. That he had. That was it. That's our introduction to Melchizedek. There is absolutely nothing else in the Bible about Melchizedek until here. Okay? So again, I think it's the connection between this guy being both king and high priest. He had both the authority, but the humility to be the true servant of God. And so this is what the argument, I think, the author is trying to make. Um, again, this priest Melchizedek was accepted by Abraham. He was not a Jew, but it indicates that Jesus, too, has this R about him because Melchizedek is kind of a mysterious figure. We don't really know who he is. Jesus is also this mysterious figure. He has this aura about him, a mystery about him. Aaron, we can understand. He was that guy down the street, okay? And we know who Aaron is. But Melchizedek just shows up with that regal attire. But then what does he do? He comes and brings bread and wine. He comes to be a servant. What does Jesus do? He comes with that regal attire. He comes to be king. He should be king. But what does he do? He takes off his robe. He stoops down and he washes the feet of his disciples. Oh. This is the nature, the character of the Jesus that we serve. And this is what this passage is trying to tell us. Jesus, you see, he really rejected the, all the trappings of being the Messiah, the title, the prestige. He was worthy of exaltation, but he led a life of humility. This is what made Jesus from all the other pretenders who wanted to claim the title of Messiah, who wanted to take it by force and exalt in their glorified position. He uses his title, his authority, to intercede for us and be there on our behalf. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what an amazing passage this is. It is such a wonderful argument about the nature and the character of Jesus Christ, the King who came to serve. Wow, the servant King. We are so grateful that you came to stand in the gap on our behalf to intercede for us. Wow, you just won our salvation and that of the entire world you came to save them as well. So help us, God, to open up the good news of the love of God as gifted to us in Jesus Christ so that this world might know the same hope that we have in you. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, may the Lord bless you this day and keep you and send you forth in peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessings to you. Uh, next week we will have one more Bible study before or as we enter into the season of Holy Week. And we hope you have a wonderful Holy Week. Please check our Facebook page for all of the announcements about our Holy Week services. We have both in-person services and we also will have streaming services for those who prefer to watch there. So blessings to you. Have a great, great week.